In 1985 and 86, the United States government sold military-grade weapons to the country of Iran, a sponsor of various terrorist groups, as a ransom for hostages held by some of those same groups that Iran sponsored. Money received from these weapon sales was secretly diverted to fund a covert army, the Contras, that was fighting against the socialist government of Nicaragua. All of these actions were either illegal or contrary to the stated policy of the United States, or both. This is about as concise an explanation as you can make of the Iran-Contra scandal. And, by definition, an explanation that short leaves out almost everything important, particularly the very deep questions of why these events happened, what they mean, and why we should try to understand them. The purpose of this video is to try to delve into some of those very complex questions, answer them to the extent we can, but also give some context, and to give you some insight on these events that you'd otherwise miss from a more superficial examination of Iran-Contra. Yes, Iran-Contra is hellaciously complicated. Yes, any in-depth explanation of it very quickly starts to resemble the famous wall of crazy meme. But if you want to understand it, if you want to dare to pull on one of the threads of this tangled historical web, you've clicked on the right video. This is not just Iran-Contra explained, it'll be, I hope, Iran-Contra deconstructed. Hi, I'm Sean Munger, I'm a PhD historian, and I've done a lot of in-depth historical stuff on this channel, from Byzantine history, to ships and nautical subjects, to historical analyses of popular movies. In my videos, I always try to provide as much context as possible, and to try to get, the bottom, to get to the bottom of why things happened, as opposed to just what happened. That's what I hope to do in this video. Of the well-known presidential scandals in recent American history, from Watergate to the Clinton-Lewinsky scandal to the events leading up to Donald Trump's first and second impeachments, Iran-Contra is a bit of a sleeper. It's the one that's the hardest to explain and understand, and the one that gets the least attention. Part of that is because it's incredibly complex. I mean, trying to make sense of Iran-Contra is a pretty daunting intellectual puzzle. As a result, it sort of scares people off. I teach courses on American history, and I have to admit, reluctantly, that I usually don't include much about Iran-Contra. Not because it's not important, but because it tends to confuse the hell out of even the most advanced history students, and it's very time-intensive to teach. Because a lot of, not a lot of people know much about it, Iran-Contra tends to reflect ideological biases in a way that other presidential scandals don't, or don't as much. Arising at a time that political partisanship and tribalism was really beginning to sharpen and intensify, Iran-Contra is sort of a Rorschach test. What you see in it depends a lot on your per political persuasion. To someone for whom Ronald Reagan was an unqualified hero, it's tempting to conclude that Iran-Contra was a nothing burger, a smear job by Democrats to tarnish the great Gipper, and that Oliver North and John Poindexter were great patriotic Americans who were unfairly pilloried for doing their duty. Conversely, to someone for whom Reagan tends to be a villain, it's equally tempting to conclude that Iran-Contra is the final evidence of his perfidy, a crooked deal from start to finish, that he knew everything and covered it all up. Oh, and the same goes for George Bush too. I mean, George Bush won, not literally George Bush too. In any event, I think you can make a case that the Iran-Contra affair is one of the most difficult problems in recent American history. Thus, trying to explain and deconstruct it is an unusually tall order. But if you want to understand it, I hope you'll allow me the chance to do that. This is a long video. I don't expect people to watch it all at once. What I suggest you do is bookmark it and work your way through it over a period of time. To help you do that, I've broken it up into chapters that are grouped around particular subjects, from context and background to specific chains of events relevant to the story. So do look at the chapters as we proceed. Also, to try to help you make sense of this story, I'm going to use lots of illustrations and graphics, particularly where it comes to people. There's a huge cast of characters in this story, and I'll try to remind you of them by showing you their heads and often their names on the screen at key moments. So that, for example, is Oliver North, that is Poindexter, that is Gorbanifar, no smoking in here please sir. Anyway, you get the idea. 
I'm going to try to help you out as much as possible. I know this stuff is complex. I'm on your side. I got your back. Now, as we are headed into one of the densest historical jungles in recent memory, I suggest you find a comfortable place to sit, top up on your beverage of choice, and get ready for a brain buster of a story. Before we even get to arms deals or Swiss bank accounts or secret armies mucking about in Central American rainforests, we've got an unusually large amount of context to get behind us. Our first stop is the Middle East, specifically Tehran, by way of Beirut. This is Beirut, the capital of Lebanon in the early 1970s. That is where Lebanon is, by the way, on the eastern side of the Mediterranean, just above Israel. Beirut was a beautiful city that was highly welcoming to foreigners. People used to call it the Paris of the Middle East. In 1975, a civil war broke out in Lebanon. Now, if you think Iran-Contra is complex enough, I won't multiply your pain exponentially by trying to explain the origins of the Lebanese civil war. I don't even fully understand it. But suffice it to say, Lebanon was ethnically and religiously diverse with significant Christian and Muslim communities. It had traditionally been governed by members of the Christian community. But as more and more Palestinians settled in Lebanon, many of them driven out of their homeland by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the demographics of Lebanon began to shift. The Lebanese Civil War, which turned the Paris of the Middle East into a blasted hellhole of crumbling rubble, was not fought primarily by organized state armies, but by militias that tended to be ethnically and religiously homogenous. So you had Christian militias fighting Muslim militias, and you had Sunni Muslim militias and Shia Muslim militias, and militias with various ideologies from rightist to leftist and everywhere in between. It was a huge mess, and the war seemed to go on forever. Let's leave Beirut behind us for now, we'll have to return soon enough, and shift to Tehran, the capital of Iran. In February 1979, Iran's king, the Shah, heavily supported by the United States and a personal friend of President Jimmy Carter, was overthrown in a revolution that brought a hard-lined fundamentalist Islamic government to power in the form of the Ayatollah Khomeini. Khomeini and most of Iran's people were Shia Muslims, just like significant numbers of Muslims in Lebanon. Shia Muslims, whether they lived in Lebanon or Iraq or elsewhere, tended to look toward Khomeini as a spiritual leader. Hold that thought, it becomes important later. Anyway, the Shah, who as you recall was Jimmy Carter's friend, fled Iran and then came down with a very unfortunate form of cancer, which at that time could only be treated in the United States. Against the counsel of most of his advisors, Carter decided, for humanitarian reasons, to let the Shah come to the U.S. for medical treatment. This enraged the people of Iran, who had come to see the Shah as an oppressor. In November 1979, a group of these enraged people in Tehran stormed the U.S. Embassy and took a bunch of its employees as hostages. They demanded that Carter send the Shah to Iran to face trial for his crimes against the Iranian people. Carter refused. Though taking the hostages wasn't Khomeini's idea, he backed the radical group that did it, so it effectively became his policy. The hostage crisis dragged on for more than a year. At one point, Carter attempted a military rescue of the hostages, but it failed. In case you're wondering, the Shah's cancer treatment didn't work. He died, but Iran would still not release the hostages. Let's shift now from Tehran to Detroit. Yes, Detroit, as in Michigan. Unfortunately for him, the year that the hostage crisis stretched on through was 1980, the year Jimmy Carter was running for re-election. His opponent was Ronald Reagan, former governor of California, who clinched the Republican nomination in the primaries. The guy who came in a distant second in those primaries was George Bush. Hold that thought, it becomes important later. You may wonder why we're orbiting this high-rise hotel in Detroit. It's because this is where Reagan and his campaign team stayed during the Republican National Convention in July 1980. And it was where Reagan made a world-changing decision. Coming into the convention, Reagan and his campaign people, including his campaign manager, William Casey, had a bizarre idea to offer the vice presidential nomination to former President Gerald Ford, 
whom Carter had defeated in 1976. A Reagan-Ford ticket they thought would be unbeatable, but the problem was that Ford, who was also staying at this hotel, wanted a lot of concessions from Reagan in exchange for agreeing to be vice president. We don't need to go into all that, but suffice it to say, the deal to get Ford on the ticket fell apart at the last minute, just before Reagan was supposed to announce his vice presidential running mate. Reagan and Casey were so hot on the Ford idea that they had no plan B. When Ford was suddenly out of the running, they had to scramble to find an acceptable vice presidential nominee. In three minutes, yes, three minutes, Reagan made the snap decision to offer the VP spot to George Bush, the guy who came in second in the primaries. Bush understood that his political career was over if he didn't take the offer. He had no platform to relaunch his career, so he decided to take it. This snap decision, made in three minutes in a Detroit high-rise hotel room, changed American and world history. After their coronation at the convention, Reagan and Bush went out campaigning. They pilloried Carter not merely for being weak, but for humiliating America in the eyes of the world by not being able to resolve the hostage crisis. Let's shift back to the Middle East, to Baghdad now, the capital of Iraq. We're in the summer and fall of 1980. The previous year, 1979, Iraq had been taken over by an ambitious party boss and would-be dictator, Saddam Hussein. He was powerful, but his regime was a little shaky at first. Saddam was a Sunni Muslim. The majority of people in Iraq were Shia Muslims. Now, remember how I said that the Ayatollah Khomeini was sort of the unofficial leader of Shia Muslims everywhere, even outside Iran? Well, Saddam was afraid that Iraq's Shia Muslims would be more loyal to Khomeini than to him. Partly for this reason, and partly for a complex bundle of other reasons which we don't need to go into, Saddam Hussein's Iraq provoked a war with Khomeini's Iran in September 1980. This would eventually become the most destructive war of the 20th century, besides the two world wars. In November 1980, Reagan crushed Carter in the presidential election. Carter had quietly been trying to negotiate with Iran to release the hostages. Ultimately, there were 52 Americans held in Tehran. After the election, but before Carter left office, his people managed to negotiate an end to the crisis, using the government of Algeria as an intermediary. The United States ended up unfreezing a bunch of financial assets belonging to Iran. Khomeini, in any event now, had bigger problems to worry about, such as that war with Iraq. However, just as one last gratuitous poke at Carter, Khomeini delayed the release of the American hostages until just after Ronald Reagan had taken the oath of office as President of the United States. In reality, Reagan had nothing to do with the release of the hostages, but Khomeini helped him out with optics that made him look good and which reinforced the appearance of Carter as a hapless wimp. Now, there was a conspiracy theory popular in the early 90s about this called October Surprise. The idea was that officials of the Reagan campaign, in some versions of the story George Bush himself, negotiated supposedly with the government of Iran to delay the release of the hostages until after the 1980 election. These allegations were investigated in the 90s, including by a congressional committee, and no evidence supporting them was found. We have enough real conspiracies in the story of Iran-Contra as it is. I don't think we need to spend much time on the unfounded ones. Let's shift back to Lebanon, where, as I hope you recall, that brutal civil war was still going on. By 1982, the war had begun to pull in various other factions and countries from outside Lebanon, including the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, which was the chief coordinator of Palestinian resistance to Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Confused yet? Syria was also involved. In June 1982, Israel invaded southern Lebanon to try to crush the PLO, which was operating from that area. In response to this, in July 1982, the president of the American University of Beirut, a man named David Dodge, was abducted by terrorists in Beirut. The group that kidnapped him, Islamic Jihad, was a militant Shia organization sponsored by the government of Iran. The idea was to use Dodge, an American, 
as a hostage to get the Reagan administration to pressure Israel to withdraw from Lebanon. You could say that this crime, the abduction of David Dodge, was the seed of Iran-Contra. Dodge was released about a year later in July 1983, but his abduction was the start of a whole new hostage crisis, a new spin in the endless cycle of terrorism connected to Iran and the Lebanese civil war. In the late summer of 1982, the United States, as well as a few other Western countries, did try to broker a ceasefire between Israel and the PLO in Lebanon. A multinational force comprised of troops from the U.S., Britain, France, and Italy went into Beirut to supervise the withdrawal of PLO forces from Lebanon. This force included about 800 U.S. Marines. On April 18, 1983, Islamic Jihad, that same terrorist group that was holding David Dodge, probably working with another group called Hezbollah, carried out an attack against the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. A suicide truck bomber blew up 63 people, including 17 Americans. This was bad enough, but an even more monstrous attack occurred a few months later. On October 23, 1983, Iranian-sponsored terrorists, again using suicide truck bombs, blew up two barracks buildings containing U.S. Marines and French troops. The French suffered 58 casualties, the Americans 241. The Reagan administration's response to these attacks was incoherent for reasons I'll get into in the next chapter. Despite talking tough about not being pushed around by terrorists, there was no coordinated retaliation. Although in December 1983, the battleship USS New Jersey, which was parked offshore, fired some shells at neighborhoods in Beirut, where terrorists believed to be associated with those who did the bombing were thought to have their headquarters. Also in December 1983, Iranian-sponsored terrorists staged another coordinated attack, this time in Kuwait City, believed to be retaliation for the United States and Kuwait supporting Iraq in the Iran-Iraq War. This bombing didn't kill a lot of people. Some of the explosives failed to go off and the targeting was faulty, but the incident was to have a huge effect down the road. One of the groups that claimed responsibility for this attack was called the Islamic Dawah Party. After the December 83 attacks, Kuwait conducted a dragnet and rounded up a bunch of terrorists associated with this group. 17 of them went to prison for a long, long time. They were known as the al Dawa prisoners. In 1984, Hezbollah, another group believed to be Iranian-sponsored, began taking more Americans hostage in Beirut, and they demanded the release of those al dawa prisoners as ransom. This was not the only demand made by the hostage-taking groups, but it was one that kept coming up. For example, Terry Anderson, an Associated Press reporter kidnapped in March 1985, was told that he was being held for the ransom of the al dawa prisoners. By the middle of 1985, Ronald Reagan was facing a protracted hostage crisis involving Iran that was very similar to the one that had haunted Jimmy Carter and that Reagan himself had used as a political tool to defeat Jimmy Carter in 1980. The Reagan administration's stated policy was not to negotiate with terrorists. They didn't really have a lot of options on how to deal with this. On June 14, 1985, a TWA-727 jet on a long-haul trip from Cairo to Los Angeles was hijacked in midair, shortly after making a stop at Athens, Greece. It's not entirely clear who the perps were this time. Probably Hezbollah, but not a slam dunk. The terrorists killed one American, a U.S. Navy enlisted man named Robert Steedham, and they dumped his body out of the plane onto the runway. This iconic image, one of the most famous of the 1980s, resulted from this attack, where one of the terrorists held a gun to the head of the TWA pilot during his conversation with news media. The terrorists demanded the release of hundreds of prisoners across the Middle East, including the al Dawa prisoners, as well as many others being held by Israel. After leapfrogging to various airports around the region for two weeks, the TWA hostages were eventually released on June 30th. Israel had indeed begun to free many of the prisoners that the hijackers demanded, but Reagan administration officials assiduously denied that they had pressured Israel to do it, even though they sort of did. 
Even after the TWA passengers were safe, though, there were at that time seven Americans being held by Iranian-sponsored groups in Lebanon. The cycle of terrorism brought the issue of hostages to the forefront of Reagan's foreign policy. Between the seizure of multiple hostages, the TWA hijacking, and emotional meetings between Reagan and the families of the hostages, by mid-1985, the hostage issue was at the top of Reagan's priority list. This was to set the stage for the Iran-Contra affair. Before we get there, we have to take a brief look at what was going on inside Reagan's White House, and even a little bit farther back than that, to Reagan's origins in state politics in California. Ronald Reagan was a B-list movie actor in the golden age of Hollywood before he turned to politics in the mid-1960s. Elected governor of California in 1966, his appeal was based largely on what today we would call culture war issues, standing against the political and social changes sweeping America in the late 1960s. Reagan particularly hated college protesters against the Vietnam War. His election as president in 1980 is often seen as a conservative reaction to the turmoil of the 1960s and 70s. Because his background was in state politics and his main focus were identity and cultural issues, Reagan wasn't very well versed in foreign policy. What opinions he had about foreign affairs in 1980 centered primarily around communism and the Soviet Union. He wanted to take a hard line against them, and a centerpiece of his first term agenda was greatly increased defense spending to counter Soviet and communist bloc military power, particularly in Europe. Beyond this, though, Reagan really didn't have that many thoughts on foreign policy, and it was not destined to be the strong suit of his administration as he constructed it when he got into office in 1981. There was a very simple reason for this. Reagan chose as his Secretary of State George Shultz, who had been a minor cabinet official under Richard Nixon. He chose as Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, who had also been in the Nixon cabinet, and who'd come up in California politics at the same time that Reagan was making his mark. The problem was that these two guys, Schultz and Weinberger, were exact opposites. They disagreed on almost everything, and they hated each other personally. The result in the Reagan cabinet was paralysis, because Schultz typically wanted to do something, and Weinberger usually wanted to do the opposite. Reagan typically avoided making a decision that would piss off either one of them, and thus he just didn't do anything. Case in point, retaliation for the Marine barracks bombing. Schultz wanted a strong retaliation. Weinberger argued against it. Reagan's solution to have the USS New Jersey fire a couple of shells at Beirut was a lame attempt to split the difference, and it didn't work. Reagan was not fond of confrontation. He also wasn't very hands-on. He delegated almost everything. As a result, his advisors, when they needed a decision from the president, carefully controlled the information that he was exposed to and presented him with a limited menu of options to choose from. For most of Reagan's first term, three advisors in particular effectively gated access to President Reagan. These were his chief of staff, James Baker, Deputy Chief of Staff Michael Deaver, and Ed Meese, counselor to the president, later attorney general. In fact, these three together were known informally as the Troika. But then in early 1985, there was a change at the White House. Donald Regan, Secretary of the Treasury, yes, I realize how confusing it is to have a Donald Regan and a Ronald Reagan in the same White House. Anyway, Donald Regan decided to switch jobs with James Baker. Baker, who was chief of staff, was getting burnt out. By all accounts, Reagan, sorry, Reagan was somewhat power hungry. The switch, which was not Ronald Reagan's idea, occurred in January 1985. The age of the Troika controlling access and information that flowed to President Reagan was over. Now, after January 1985, everything went through chief of staff Donald Reagan. Regan, who had been the chairman of Wall Street firm Merrill Lynch before coming to government, knew Butkus about foreign policy. He relied principally on the president's national security advisor, Robert McFarlane, to handle everything related to foreign affairs. Reagan was also being manipulated from an entirely different angle. 
He listened a lot to his wife, Nancy Reagan, who exerted a tremendous amount of control behind the scenes of the White House. Nancy had her own chief advisor, a celebrity astrologer named Joan Quigley, whom she consulted frequently. Quigley would look into the stars and tell Mrs. Reagan which days were quote-unquote favorable for her husband to make big policy decisions. Quigley's influence on the Reagan White House was kept a carefully guarded secret for years. Now, if this all sounds nuts, it should. Reagan knew about the astrologer, but he couldn't do anything about it. His boss listened to his wife, and she listened to Joan. Reagan was intent on controlling access to the president, mainly so he could manipulate the decisions that were being made. If anything got done in terms of foreign policy, it wasn't because any sort of formal decision got made. The logjam between Schultz and Weinberger typically prevented that, but it would be because Robert McFarlane, the national security advisor, would make an end run around them and get, to the, get the president to do what he, McFarlane, wanted. In short, the Reagan White House by the middle of 1985 was a pretty dangerous place where good policy decision-making processes went to die. If you're getting the impression that the Iran-Contra affair is going to involve Ronald Reagan's advisors doing stuff behind his back without telling him and then backstabbing each other to get a bigger piece of the action, you're absolutely right. That is exactly where this is going. Before we get to the arms deals, let's delve into one final piece of context. That requires a rather radical shift of venue, from Washington, D.C. to the rainforests of Central America, specifically Nicaragua, by way, rhetorically speaking, of Southeast Asia. Ronald Reagan, as you recall, entered politics in the 1960s, when American involvement in the Vietnam War was ramping up. He was also a staunch cold warrior and anti-communist. His central obsession was the very old Cold War idea that the Soviet Union was a giant octopus, extending its tentacles everywhere it could in the world and ultimately trying to foment a world socialist revolution. This kind of thinking straight out of the 1950s was the main assumption that led the United States into Vietnam. You may have heard of the domino theory. This was the idea that if one country in Southeast Asia turned communist, eventually all of them would. This idea justified vast expenditures of blood and treasure to prevent U.S. ally South Vietnam from uniting with communist North Vietnam. That didn't end up going so well. The Vietnam War killed 58,000 Americans and more than a million Vietnamese, and in the end, all of Vietnam did go communist, which strangely did not prove to be the end of the world. Let's shift now from Southeast Asia to Central America. Even before the Cold War, this region had long been a playground for U.S. governments and business interests to throw their weight around, and the fight against communism post-1945 made that tendency even worse. Whenever it looked like a left-wing or even left-leaning regime might come to power in any South or Central American country, the United States got very, very nervous. Cuba, after all, had become a Soviet client state after a leftist revolution overthrew the U.S.-backed government there in 1959. If you believed in domino theory in Southeast Asia, chances are pretty good that you believe the same thing applied in Central America, too. This was why Ronald Reagan was really scared of what happened in Nicaragua. In 1979, after a revolution and a bloody civil war, a party called the FSLN came to power in Nicaragua. The FSLN was a socialist party, commonly called the Sandinistas, named after a guerrilla hero who died in the 1930s, and they revolted against the right-wing government of Anastasio Somoza, who had been backed by the U.S. until Carter ended his support for him. Leftist guerrillas fighting right-wing governments, often backed by the U.S., was a common thing in Central America. It was also happening in El Salvador, going, then going through its own bloody civil war, and also Guatemala. The CIA was deeply involved in these countries, often running covert operations to disrupt the leftist guerrilla factions. American policymakers tended to see Central America as black and white, democracy versus communism, that kind of Cold War struggle, thereby missing all the nuance of what was really going on. It is time now for the people of the United States to unite. 
with President Reagan to reverse the trends in Central America. Will you back President Reagan and make your voice heard for peace through strength by signing this resolution? When Reagan came to power in 1981, he was alarmed at the Sandinista regime in Nicaragua. A strong believer in domino theory, Reagan desperately wanted to take the Sandinistas out to prevent, as he saw it, all of Central America eventually going communist. But Congress, controlled by Democrats, who by 1981 generally didn't believe in domino theory anymore, didn't see it that way. When the FSLN, the Sandinistas, flipped Nicaragua in 1979, the opposition to them became the guerrilla force within that country. They were known as the Contras, but they weren't that unified. In fact, there were three major factions within the Contras that were constantly squabbling with each other. In 1981, the CIA started supplying weapons to the Contras and helped them run covert operations against the Sandinista government. Predictably, they did not tell Congress about any of these operations. The head of the CIA under Reagan was William Casey, the same guy who had managed his 1980 campaign and who was involved in the botched effort to get Ford on the ticket. A veteran of World War II espionage operations, Casey was himself an unreconstructed Cold Warrior who wanted to take a hard line against communism and thought Congress and the democratic process just gummed up the works, and Casey loved covert operations. In 1982, the Democratic-controlled Congress, afraid that the Reagan administration and the CIA were going to get the U.S. pulled into another Vietnam-style quagmire, passed a law officially banning the United States from giving military aid to the Contras. This law was popularly known as the Boland Amendment. Fear of another Vietnam wasn't the only motivating factor. The Contras themselves were, in fact, pretty horrible, routinely assassinating civilians, including priests and healthcare workers, engaging in torture, and committing numerous human rights violations. The Reagan administration, like most U.S. administrations, turned a blind eye to these abuses because it thought that the ends justified the means. Preventing communism from taking over Central America was, to them, worth the carnage, a rather cynical view. Reagan was incensed that Congress had cut off military aid to the Contras. He really, really wanted to keep backing them. In fact, this was his pet cause. Advisors said that mere mention of the Contras caused Reagan to, quote, go bananas. With the U.S. government, and particularly the CIA, banned from helping them, enterprising officials in Reagan's government started to think up new ways to keep the lifeline going for Reagan's pet cause. One of the ways they did this was to get other countries to give money to the Contras on the unspoken assumption that this would buy favorable treatment from Ronald Reagan. For example, in early 1985, Robert McFarlane got the government of Saudi Arabia to donate $24 million to the Contras. Officials also hit up wealthy private citizens in the United States and directed those funds secretly to the Contras. The chief official in charge of doing this sort of thing was a Marine lieutenant colonel named Oliver North. A Vietnam veteran who predictably felt the U.S. effort in that war had been sabotaged by liberals at home, North had a lot of baggage left over from that conflict. Though still a Marine, he went to work for the National Security Agency in 1981. There, he was involved in various covert operations. We're still not sure exactly what, because they were, of course, of course covert, and also because North had a tendency to exaggerate his accomplishments, for example, embellishing his role in the 1983 U.S. invasion of the small Caribbean island of Grenada. Concerning Nicaragua, North's job was basically to run and fund a secret war on behalf of the Contras, a war that the U.S. government was technically prohibited legally from supporting. Just so you know, North was not doing this entirely on his own. He was an employee of the National Security Agency, an organization run out of the White House, not accountable directly to Congress or any cabinet-level agency. North's direct boss was Admiral John Poindexter, the Deputy National Security Advisor. His boss was Robert McFarlane, who reported directly to President Reagan. In 
At this time, 1985, there's no evidence that Ronald Reagan even knew who Oliver North was. Oh, I should mention something else because you guessed it, it becomes important later. All these national security agency guys are communicating with each other via computer on a brand new system of interlinked systems called PROFS or Professional Office System. Basically, email. The whole concept of email was brand new in 1985, and the National Security Agency was using it because they thought it was super secure. Hmm, foreshadowing? Anyway, back to Oliver North. When it came to the Contras, North was in charge of sending privately raised funds to them and then helping them buy the stuff they needed. Fancy toys like helicopters and missiles, and then basic stuff like bullets and rifles and uniforms. North's little scheme went by a couple of names, such as The Enterprise and also Project Democracy. It had secret Swiss bank accounts to shift money around without being noticed. North was also able to use, off the record of course, CIA tools to get the stuff he needed to the Contras. Example, the CIA had its own private airline called Southern Air Transport that operated secret flights into Central America from various points of origin often dropping pallets of weapons or supplies for the Contras that had been purchased by Project Democracy. A man named Richard Secord, a former Air Force officer with extensive experience in covert operations, and his business partner, Albert Hakim, were involved in these logistics. Remember that, it becomes important later. I'm getting tired of saying that. So, you got all this? A secret war in Central America, officially illegal, funded off the books, run by NSA personnel, including Oliver North, occasionally borrowing CIA assets to make it all work. What could possibly go wrong? Now, finally, finally, after all this context, we get to the arms deals. That's the next chapter. On June 17, 1985, while the TWA 847 thing was still going on, Robert McFarlane wrote a memo to the rest of the National Security Council suggesting that the United States reach out to Iran in the hopes of building a relationship with more moderate elements who might be willing to deal with what Khomeini called the Great Satan. McFarlane suggested that a carrot they might offer the Iranians was, quote, selected military equipment. The memo got a big belly laugh from both Secretary of State George Shultz and Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, who uncharacteristically agreed with each other. They both thought it was nuts. There were no quote-unquote moderates in Iran's government, they thought, and in any event, the idea of selling weapons to a state sponsor of terrorism was against one of Reagan's most firmly held policies. A couple of weeks later, on July 3rd, 1985, a former Israeli intelligence officer named David Kimchi and a few other Israelis met with McFarlane and had a suggestion. They told McFarlane that these mythical moderate elements did exist, and they could possibly get to them by using as a go-between a man named Manukar Gorbanifar, an international arms dealer. Gorbanifar had been born in Iran and left at the time of the revolution, but Kimchi and the Israelis said he knew some of these moderates. They'd talk with the U.S., possibly even about pressuring terrorist groups to release hostages if the U.S. sold them 100 anti-tank missiles. To keep American fingerprints off the sale, the missiles would be transferred from Israel, not the United States. Israel bought most of its weapons from the U.S., McFarlane reported the meeting to Reagan, who seemed agreeable to letting McFarlane open negotiations with Gorbanifar. The matter was discussed again a few weeks later. This meeting proved problematic because it happened in Ronald Reagan's hospital room just after he had surgery for colon cancer. It was never clear exactly what he agreed to in this meeting or, perhaps more importantly, what others, including McFarlane and Donald Reagan, thought he agreed to. Under existing law, Israel could not transfer weapons of American manufacture to a third country without the United States' specific approval. When the Israelis trying to put together the deal requested this approval in early August, there was another meeting at the White House. 
Again, both Schultz and Weinberger were uncharacteristically uh, united in agreement that this whole thing was a terrible idea. No decision was made at this meeting. But a few days later, McFarlane said that President Ronald Reagan called him on the phone and told him to go ahead. There's no evidence other than McFarlane's word that this is actually how it happened. The White House had no record of the call being made. Reagan said later that he couldn't remember it. That's going to become a thing in this story, Reagan saying he doesn't remember something. On August 20th, 1985, Israel shipped about 90 TOW, T-O-W, missiles, anti-tank missiles, to Iran. The actual supposed three-way deal between Iran, Israel, and the U.S., brokered by Gorbanifar, who collected a big commission, naturally, called for 500 missiles to swap for all the hostages. When Israel sent the first 90 missiles or so, Gorbanifar told McFarlane that the Iranians were waiting for the other 400 before releasing any hostages. McFarlane, curiously not smelling a rat in this deal, agreed. On September 15th, Israel shipped another 408 missiles to Iran. Kimchi, the Israeli, then called McFarlane and said, well, we kind of made a mistake. The people we're dealing with in Iran don't have the power to release all the hostages, but they might release one. One hostage was released, Benjamin Weir, who appeared on a street in Beirut the same day, September 15th. But that was it. McFarlane kept hoping that the Iranians would release someone else. They didn't. The whole thing was basically a swindle. Expecting all seven hostages freed, they only got one, and it cost 500 tow missiles. Gorbanifar, however, pressed for more. Now he told McFarland that Iran wanted a different kind of missile, Hawk missiles, more expensive, but they could get, they meaning the Iranians, could get the rest of the hostages out and without Khomeini from finding out about it. Gorbanifar also hinted that if the missile deals didn't continue, the terrorists holding American hostages in Lebanon would kill them. In reality, they never made this threat. Gorbanifar, who made sweet bank on commissions on the arms deals, was self-interested to keep them going. As Israel got involved again in this second deal, the Israeli government, which agreed to transfer the Hawks, pressed McFarland for a guarantee that the U.S. would replenish Israel's supply of Hawk missiles after the transfer. These requests hit at a bad time. Reagan was at the time in Geneva, Switzerland, for the first of his famous summit meetings with this new Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev. Once again, it's not clear who exactly agreed to what. But in Geneva, Schultz got wind of the plan and blew up, recognizing that it definitely was arms for hostages. But McFarlane interpreted the will of Ronald Reagan as deeming him to go ahead. But because he was busy working on that summit meeting, McFarlane delegated the operational details of the transfer to Oliver North. Now, for some reason, I don't fully understand. The plane full of missiles left Israel and was supposed to land in Lisbon, Portugal, before going on to Tehran. But the Portuguese authorities refused permission for the plane to go on. That plane had to turn around and return to Israel. North, who apparently believed all the remaining hostages would be sprung at this time, scrambled to find a replacement aircraft. To get one, he turned to Richard Secord, with whom he'd worked previously on various Contra operations, to get a plane, which had previously been used to drop stuff off for the Contras. This plane was used to take missiles uh, in Israel and fly them to Tehran. Secord was really good at this kind of thing, so this is exactly what he did. Now, this was an issue because in order to use CIA assets, which Secord was involved with, the National Security Agency, which North worked for, had to have what was called a finding, a document addressed to Congress that explained what was going on. There was no finding for this Hawk missile shipment, which went to Iran thanks to Secord's help on November 25, 1985. For his part, running true to form, Gorbanifar did the Charlie Brown's football thing again. He told McFarlane, after the missiles got to Iran, that the Iranians were pissed because they were first the wrong kind of missile, and they even still had Israeli markings on them. In fact, they were so pissed that they refused to release any more hostages. McFarlane was now at wit's end. 
Not only was this Iran thing blowing up in his face, but he thought Donald Reagan, who hated him, was spreading rumors throughout Washington that McFarlane, who was married, was having a re an affair with a Washington reporter. McFarlane also struggled with depression. On December 4th, 1985, he resigned as National Security Advisor. Honestly, you can't blame him, but this was the wrong time to change horses. McFarland's replacement was his former deputy, John Poindexter. And the very day that McFarland threw in the towel, North, who was eager to impress his new boss, wrote a huge memo outlining a bold and broadened plan for the Iran hostage initiative. North proposed to swap over 3,000 missiles to Iran directly without Israel as an intermediary in exchange for all the re remaining American hostages plus a French hostage. In this memo, North also included the imaginary threat invented by Gorbanifar that the hostages would be killed if the U.S. turned off the deals. In the meantime, the CIA, in order to solve that little problem about having done the November 25th missile shipment without a finding, drafted one that would cover the shipment retroactively, which also notably and illegally said that Congress shouldn't be informed. On December 6, 1985, Poindexter brought this paper to Reagan. He signed it without reading it. Later, Reagan would say he couldn't remember signing it, and in any event, months later, Poindexter tore up the only copy of it. The day after that, December 7th, the National Security Council met specifically to discuss the Iran Initiative. But this meeting was curiously incomplete. McFarlane, who was no longer National Security Advisor but still in the loop, led the meeting. But he did not address the shipment that had just gone through, and he carefully avoided any mention of the finding that Reagan had signed the day before. Schultz and Weinberger were there. George Bush was not. Weinberger warned Reagan that this whole thing was an awful idea. Schultz also blew up at it all over again. Typically for his management style, Reagan didn't make any final decision, except he seemed to uh, McFarlane and Poindexter to agree that further talks should go ahead with Gorbanifar to see if the Iranians could be persuaded to release any hostages without getting weapons first. In actuality, at the very time this meeting was held, Oliver North was already in Europe negotiating with Gorbanifar for more arms for hostages deals. One last thing about these early deals. When North was scrambling around trying to find a plane to take that November shipment of missiles to Iran, and when he got Secord involved, a million dollars of money that Israel transferred to the United States, part of the payment for the missiles, was shunted into one of North's Project Democracy accounts, one of his Swiss bank accounts. This was done in case Secord needed some money to facilitate the transfer, in other words, bribes. Well, it turned out that Secord didn't need to use much of this fund. After the shipment was over, there was $850,000 of this money left. North, who thought it was just surplus money, transferred it to one of the Contra accounts. That was the first time that money had been diverted from the Iran arms sales to the Contras. And at the time, it was kind of an afterthought, but it would definitely prove not to be the last diversion. Because it looked like they were going to do a newer, bigger, more missile version of the Iran Initiative, as per North's December 4th memo, the National Security Council needed a finding, not retroactive this time, to approve it. On January 6th, 1986, Poindexter drafted one and brought it to President Reagan in advance of a meeting that was supposed to happen the next day. Reagan didn't realize that the document was a draft, not a final version. He went ahead and signed it. Apparently, that was not unusual. He signed just about everything his advisors put in front of him, sometimes without reading the documents first. So, that next day, January 7th, 1986, the full National Security Council met to discuss the whole Iran thing. This time, everybody important was there, including George Bush and CIA Director William Casey. Just as they had before, Schultz and Weinberger, on the same side, tore into it. Everybody else thought it was a fantabulous idea, including, and perhaps especially, 
Bush. In later years, when pressed on Iran-Contra, Bush repeatedly minimized his input at this meeting. Casey was also enthusiastic. This despite the fact that he knew Gorbanifar had spectacularly failed a polygraph test he was given and was known to be a liar and exaggerator. It was clear that Reagan wanted to go ahead. He was especially motivated by the idea that the lives of the hostages were at stake if they didn't continue the deals. Donald Reagan, chief of staff, who had been opposed to the idea the first time, first couple of times it was mentioned, was now suddenly all for it, probably because he realized Reagan was for it. The key thing about this new plan was that in future shipments, the weapons would not go through Israel. Gorbanifar would still make his commission as the broker, but Israel wouldn't have to be cut in on anything. Oliver North figured out that the CIA could buy, in quotes, the missiles from the Department of Defense for a $2.5 million profit. On January 17, 1986, Poindexter brought President Reagan a new finding approving the arms sales going forward. A final one, not the draft that he'd mistakenly signed January 6th. Tellingly, Reagan, who kept a diary of his time at the White House, wrote this in his journal on that day, quote, I agreed to sell toes to Iran, end quote. After meeting with Gorbanifar again in London on January 24, 1986, North wrote another grandiose memo. In many ways, this is the most bizarre document in the whole Iran-Contra story. Gaseous and overblown, even by North standards, the document proposed a detailed timeline for Operation Recovery, involving transfers of money, missiles being flown from point A to point B, and secret meetings at the Churchill Hotel in London. This is the Churchill Hotel in London, by the way, now the Hyatt Regency. Perfect place for an arms deal, isn't it? The memo also specifies prisoner releases by Israel, payments of millions of dollars to Gorbanifar, the date all U.S. hostages are to be released, February 9th, 1986, and I don't know whether this was intended as a joke or not, but a prediction that Khomeini steps down as leader of Iran on February 11th, the anniversary of the Iranian Revolution. In February 1986, the wheels on the deals kept turning. The U.S. Army began turning over tow missiles to the CIA. Gorbanifar got bridge financing from a wealthy Saudi, Adnan Kasogi, to broker the deal. This had happened before. And by the end of the month, two shipments totaling a thousand missiles wound up in Iran. But like previous deals, it was a swindle. Contrary to North's careful timetable, no hostages were released, and Khomeini, of course, did not step down. Yet, astonishingly, despite being burned numerous times now, the Reagan administration officials continued to try to make deals. To be sure, they were egged on by Gorbanifar, who kept making false and inflated promises. On April 3, 1986, Gorbanifar met with Oliver North and some CIA agents at the Ramada Renaissance Hotel near Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C., Gorbanifar told the Americans that if a delegation came to Tehran bringing weapons with them, the Iranians would release all the rest of the hostages. After an all-night meeting, North wrote up a memo about what had been agreed to. Hold that thought. Not only is it important later, it's one of the key points of the whole story. Poindexter, though, North's boss, was losing patience with the whole thing. Gorbanifar was clearly unreliable. In fact, not long after the April meeting, he was arrested in an unrelated sting operation. He, Poindexter, wanted North to tell the Iranians that they should fork over some hostages without getting weapons in advance. The NSC team was distracted in April by Ronald Reagan's airstrikes on Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, said to be retaliation for Gaddafi's sponsorship of terrorism. But by early May, the Tehran mission was on, even though he wasn't National Security Advisor anymore, Robert McFarlane headed the mission. The whole thing was, after all, his baby. North was there, plus some CIA personnel, which I'm not going to name because there's already too many people in this story for you to keep track of. On the Iranian side, they had been told that they would be meeting with Ali Rafsanjani, the Speaker of Iran's Parliament, and also Ali Khamenei, 
the president of Iran. Both Gorbanifar and North had pumped up the idea of the mission as the start of a brand new relationship between the U.S. and Iran. McFarlane and North even brought a cake with them shaped like a key to symbolize the key to better relations. They also brought a bunch of spare parts for the tow missiles that they had already delivered and a plane, another plane full of missiles was waiting in Tel Aviv to be dispatched on McFarland's order. The Tehran mission went off the rails from the word go. No one came to meet them at the Tehran airport, at least not at first. Finally, Gorbanifar tur turned up, as well as Ahmed Kangarlu, the official buyer of arms for the Iranian government. I apologize for butchering the Persian names there. But not the top officials that they were expecting. They took the Americans to the top floor of the Estekial Hotel, which in the Shah's time was the Tehran Hilton. By all accounts, the Tehran meeting was a disaster. Several people who claimed to be Iranian government officials did show up, but they used fake names and their credentials were unverifiable. Once Gorbanifar was out of the room, McFarlane and North discovered that he lied to both sides about what the other had agreed to. He told Iranians that the Americans were bringing weapons, not just spare parts, and he told the Americans that the Iranians were going to release all the hostages. Neither was true. After some drama, which we don't really need to go into, the Americans left two days later totally empty-handed. No hostages, no deal, except for the spare parts on board the plane that they'd come to Tehran in, which the Iranian government paid for. McFarlane was bitterly disappointed. So was North. If the deal had gone through, the plane load of missiles waiting in Tel Aviv, if that had been delivered, it would have meant millions for the secret Contra project. In the meantime, Gorbanifar, who had beat the rap on that sting operation, was desperate to keep the deals going on. After all, he made a big profit on each one of these deals, and he had to pay back his bridge financier, Adnan Kasogi. Gorbanifar warned the Iranians that they would lose the opportunity to deal for American weapons that they needed if they took too hard a line. Miraculously, on July 26, 1986, another hostage, Father Lawrence Jenko, was released in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon. Just as a completely irrelevant aside, I once met Father Lawrence Jenko. He came to speak to our high school in 1988. Although the release of Jenko seemed to the Reagan administration like a miracle, the only miracle really going on was that anybody still believed in Gorbanifar's crap. He had taken it upon himself to tell Iran that the U.S. would agree to send the weapons that were supposed to have come on that plane from Tel Aviv back in May if Iran released a hostage right now. After Jenko's release, Casey, CIA director, urged Reagan to give something to Tehran as a reward for having released him. On North's written suggestion, they shipped some Hawk missile parts to Iran, which arrived on August 4, 1986. Negotiations continued throughout September and October, but it was clear by this point that the whole Iran arms deal initiative was a total mess and no more hostages were released. After more than a year of shady deals, they had bought the release of two, only two, Americans. But perhaps more importantly, at least for Oliver North, the arms deals that had gone through had resulted in hefty profits for Project Democracy, the secret Contra war. The diversion of funds from the arms sales to the Contra war was at the very heart of this scandal. That is in the next chapter. It's difficult to tell exactly when and how the diversion began. The two people who knew the most about it, Oliver North and John Poindexter, weren't exactly trustworthy. The stories they told to Congress during the investigation of the Iran-Contra affair in the summer of 1987 were almost certainly false. When he testified to Congress in July 1987, North claimed that the idea for the diversion was hatched at the Churchill Hotel during his meeting with Gorbanifar in January 1986, and that it was Gorbanifar's idea. Gorbanifar denied this, and he's probably right. North was lying. Remember the missile shipment of November 1985, the one that got screwed up 
because the Portuguese authorities wouldn't let the plane load of missiles through. When North brought Secord on board to solve that one, a million dollars was transferred in case Secord needed to bribe officials to get the plane to Iran. He didn't need it, or at least most of it, and $850,000 of that fund was left over. North diverted that money to the Contras. That seems to have been the very first diversion, and it was probably North's own idea. His day job, after all, when he wasn't moonlighting on the Iran missile deals, was to drum up money and support for the Contras. He thought that money belonged not to the U.S. government, but to Gorbanifar, the crooked arms dealer. He had no qualms about pinching it and giving it to the Contras. We know that he was doing it before January 1986, because the previous month, December 6, 1985, North told officials of the Israeli Ministry of Defense that he was going to use part of the proceeds from the sale to help the Contras. Poindexter said that North told him about the diversion for the first time in January 1986, after that Churchill Hotel meeting. Poindexter thought about it for a few minutes and decided, yeah, sure, go ahead. That is also probably false. It seems unlikely that Poindexter wouldn't have known about the diversions shortly after they began. North testified that he thought Reagan knew about the diversion. North had written a couple of memos throughout the process that mentioned it. We'll talk about one particular memo in a minute. And some of those memos he believed had gone to the president. But there was no evidence that Reagan had actually seen these memos. So, the big question, and the one at the heart of the whole Iran-Contra mess, is the obvious one. Did Reagan know about the diversion? Was it his idea? Did he order it? If he didn't, when did he first find out about it? When the whole Iran-Contra thing broke open in the fall of 1986, Reagan insisted to the public and to all investigators who ever asked that he knew nothing about the diversion. Was he lying? If so, he probably should have been impeached. If not, there was still something terribly wrong, because how could that have gone on in his White House, in his National Security Agency, without him knowing about it? This is where the Rorschach-like quality of Iran-Contra comes into play. If you see Reagan as a hero who could do no wrong, of course he didn't know, or it doesn't matter if he knew, because even if he did, it was totally okay and he did nothing wrong. If you see Reagan as a villain who could do no right, of course he lied and it was his idea in the first place, and it proves he was a Machiavellian and untrustworthy and crooked from the beginning. Looking at the historical evidence, I believe that it points in the direction of Reagan not knowing about the diversion. As meaningful as it was in a political and constitutional sense, the diversion of Iranian weapons proceeds to the Contras fell to the level of operational detail, not broad stroke policy or strategy. As we've seen, Reagan was extremely detached from the operational details of governance. He only stepped in at the broad stroke level, and sometimes not even then. His presidency was hands off, perhaps even dangerously detached from the operational detail. The precept of Occam's razor tells us that all things being equal, the simplest explanation tends to be the truth. The simplest explanation is here, I think, that the diversion was Oliver North's idea, and that he got it in November 1985 when he saw there was $850,000 in extra money sitting there after the Lisbon missile shipment. The only person exercising oversight over North was Poindexter, who loved the idea when North told him about it. And he certainly was not going to tell Reagan. Poindexter had to know this business was shady, but it was Ronald Reagan's pet project. And if any heads were to roll over it, he, Poindexter, would much rather it be his own than Ronald Reagan's. So I don't think he would have told him under any circumstances. How much money was diverted? Of a total of $16.1 million that Iran paid the United States for weapons in 1985 and 86, investigators think at least $3.8 million went to the Contras. The idea of the diversion came at exactly the right time. North's Project Democracy was running dry on funds and ideas to get funds to supply the Contras. 
In fact, few, if any, shipments of supplies had been made to them by the end of 1985. This supports the hypothesis that the diversion was kind of a desperation move, a last-ditch effort to keep the secret Contra war alive. One of the ironies of the whole Iran-Contra affair is that for their part, the Iranians discovered the diversion, or at least got close to discovering it, even before most Americans did. On June 30th, 1986, Iranian officials discovered a price list relating to missiles and parts that they'd been buying for a year now. And they discovered from this list that Gorbanifar had been overcharging them by a whopping 600%. Where was the rest of this money going? Furthermore, there's evidence that several people at the CIA knew or at least suspected that the diversion was going on, especially after North began organizing Contra supply flights in the spring of 1986, but no one spoke up about it. On April 1st, 1986, the secret effort to resupply the Contras, coordinated by Richard Secord, made its first illegal flight to drop supplies into the jungle. The meeting at the Ramada Renaissance Hotel in Washington between North, Gorbanifar, and several CIA agents took place two days later. The next day, North wrote up a revised plan for future arms for hostages deals, titled Release of American Hostages in Beirut. It was North's usual elaborate spy movie fantasy of arms shipments, money transfers, and hostage releases, just like his ludicrous January 24th memo. But on page 5 of this memo, the last page, there was an unusual paragraph. It read, quote, 12 million will be used to purchase critically needed supplies for the Nicaraguan Democratic Resistance Forces. This material is essential to cover shortages in resistance inventories resulting from their current offensives and Sandinista counterattacks, and to bridge, in quotes, the period between now and when congressionally approved lethal assistance beyond the 25 million, in quote, defensive arms can be delivered, end quote. That memo, since termed the Diversion Memo, came to light a couple of months later, on November 22, 1986, when Justice Department investigators found it in North's files. That paragraph was the bomb that blew up Ronald Reagan's presidency. The supply flights to the Contras, organized by Secord and funded by Oliver North's Project Democracy with Iran's money, started flying in early April 1986. The flights were conducted by the CIA's private airline, Southern Air Transport. They carried weapons expressly illegal under the Boland Amendment and other humanitarian aid, not all of it quite so humanitarian, to Contra camps inside Nicaragua. On June 25, 1986, Reagan's incessant lobbying of Congress to turn the tap of military aid to the Contras back on finally succeeded. The House voted for a $25 million aid package, but the authorization for military aid wouldn't start for a couple of months. North and Secord would keep the illegal supply operation going until then. On October 5th, 1986, one of Southern Air Transport's covert aircraft, a Fairchild C-123 provider, was shot down over Nicaragua by a surface-to-air missile. The plane, full of weapons for the Contras, crashed in the jungle, killing everyone on board except for one CIA man, Eugene Hassenfuss, who was the only one with a parachute. He bailed out. Hassenfuss was captured by Sandinista troops and a tape of his capture was broadcast on TV. He said to the cameraman, My name is Eugene Hassenfuss. I come from Marinette, Wisconsin. From the point of view of the outside world, this was the beginning of the Iran-Contra scandal. In reality, it was the beginning of the end. At first, White House officials denied that the Hassenfuss flight was part of a secret Contra mission. Even Reagan himself denied it at a press conference. Two days after the shootdown, on October 7th, Oliver North, tipped off by CIA Director William Casey and North's own boss, John Poindexter, began shredding documents in his office pertaining to Project Democracy. Remember that proto-email system called PROFS that the NSC was using? 
I told you it would be important. Someone on Poindexter's staff remembered that North had written a bunch of memos and emails related to various operations, both around both uh, Contra and Iran. Poindexter had the wherewithal to order them deleted, but this was 1986, before anyone knew how email worked. Yes, what you're thinking right now is exactly right. Neither he nor anyone else on the NSC staff knew that copies of all the emails and documents were stored on the server, just waiting to be discovered and become a scandal. While the administration was dealing with pesky questions about the secret aid to the Contras, incredibly, North was still putting together arms deals with Iran. He'd finally gotten a clue and got Gorbanifar out of the picture and was now dealing directly with Iranian officials. On October 28, 1986, another shipment of 500 tow missiles went to Iran. Uncharacteristically, this one did re result in the release of a hostage, David Jacobson, let loose on the streets of Beirut. North thought the Iranians promised more hostages, but typically none were forthcoming. The day after that, November 3rd, 1986, the final piece of the expose finally came. A Lebanese newspaper, Ash Shira, ran a small article detailing Robert McFarlane's secret mission to Tehran the previous spring, bringing weapons and trying to barter for the release of the remaining hostages. The story was leaked to the newspaper by an Iranian official opposed to the arms deals. If the Hassanfus shootdown had caused a minor blip in the world's press, the Ashura story caused a hurricane. Suddenly, the cover on the secret Iran arms initiative was blown. And at exactly the worst time, the next day, November 4th, was election day in the U.S., though probably not because of the exposure, Republicans lost the Senate for the first time in Ronald Reagan's presidency. Anticipating a political furor, the chief architects of the deals, McFarlane, North, Poindexter, and other members of the NSC staff, started writing down a detailed chronology of everything that had happened with the Iran arms deals, sort of a script that Reagan could work from when dealing with the press. There was just one thing, though. The chronology was deliberately inaccurate, and in some respects, outright false. The NSC people were building their cover-up. At first, North thought the Iran initiative could survive the political firestorm. But on November 8th, the government of Iran made clear that there would be no deals for the release of, future, of further American hostages, unless the al-Dawa prisoners being held captive in Kuwait, remember them, were released. Since this was one of the original demands made by Iran-connected terrorist groups when the whole hostage thing started back in 1984, basically they were back to square one. Working from inaccurate and incomplete information, some of it given to him by Poindexter, Ronald Reagan gave a speech to the nation on November 19th in which he insisted that the United States had not traded arms for hostages. He later followed this speech with a disastrous press conference in which he made several statements that various members of his administration, including Secretary of State George Shultz, knew to be false. Shultz, in fact, had a come-to-Jesus meeting with Reagan. Shultz, who, as you recall, opposed the whole idea from the get-go, told Reagan where he had misspoken. The president said that he was telling him things about the Iran initiative that he, Reagan, never knew. Schultz replied that if he was telling him things he didn't know, he, Schultz, didn't know very much. Something was terribly wrong. On November 20th, in advance of the testimony that was going to be given to Congress by CIA Director William Casey, Edwin Meese, Attorney General, decided that the White House had to know what everybody knew and had to get its story straight. So he, Meese, dispatched two informal Justice Department investigators, Reynolds and Richardson, to collect documents and talk to the principals, mainly North, Poindexter, and McFarlane. North was tipped off that the investigators were coming. North and his secretary, Fawn Hall, who incidentally was the daughter of Robert McFarlane's former secretary, had already begun destroying or altering documents earlier in the month. Beginning on Friday, November 21st, and continuing through the weekend, which was the weekend before Thanksgiving, 
they shifted into high gear. They fed reams of documents into a paper shredder, jamming it and eventually destroying it. Fawn Hall set to work altering records of financial transfers, but she did it badly, missing several key and telling details. Even as investigators were approaching their office, Hall, remembering documents that she had forgotten to destroy, stuffed them into her boots and the back of her blouse before she left the office. The key moment was on Saturday, November 22nd, when Reynolds and Richardson were going through the documents they requested from North, the ones that he hadn't shredded, altered, or had smuggled out of the office. North and Hall were pretty bad at destroying evidence, because the Justice Department investigators found, voila, right there in black and white, the diversion memo of April 4th, and specifically the paragraph, I mean the paragraph, the one that I quoted earlier. Any attempt at a cover-up was suddenly at an end. The Justice Department guys reported the memo to their boss, Ed Meese, Attorney General, who could only pray that it was just a proposal that hadn't been acted upon. Unfortunately for him, it wasn't. Meese had no choice but to tell his boss, Ronald Reagan. The disclosure was made in the presence of the Chief of Staff, Donald Reagan. He later said that he was sure, gauging from Reagan's reaction, that he hadn't known about the diversion. Reagan wasn't as good an actor as everyone thought he was. To his credit, Reagan argued that they had to make it public as soon as possible. The only one who disagreed with that was Casey, who said, predictably, that the lives of the hostages might be at stake if they blabbed. No one was listening to Casey anymore by this time. Events followed fast and furious after that. Reagan called Oliver North at his office, now eerily quiet after years of buzzing activity. You're a great American hero, Reagan said. It didn't change the fact that North was fired. Poindexter handed in his resignation. Reagan made an appearance before the press on November 25th, announcing that the diversion had been discovered and that North and Poindexter had been cashiered. The press, of course, went bananas. On November 26, 1986, the day before Thanksgiving, Ronald Reagan appointed a special commission to investigate what had happened. This commission would be headed by former Texas Senator John Tower, and his was in addition to congressional committees that were already investigating. Reagan then went off to his ranch in California for the holiday. He seemed dazed. An aide remarked that it seemed like he was living in a dream world. On December 1st, a New York Times CBS po news poll found that Ronald Reagan's approval rating had collapsed more than 20 percentage points in a single month. The most popular president in living memory had lost much of his credibility with the public. On December 20th, just before the Christmas holidays, the cold open of Saturday Night Live, the guest that week was Star Trek actor William Shatner, featured a musical number in which Shatner portrayed Ollie North, the mute Marine. North, fearing criminal prosecution, had taken the Fifth Amendment in response to congressional questioning about the affair. For all of his talk of duty at last, North's own interest for self-preservation had finally surfaced. Ronald Reagan was slow to react to the crippling damage that Iran-Contra had done to his presidency, but he did react. A Senate Select Committee released a report on the mess on January 29, 1987. The Tower Commission's report followed February 24th. Both told largely the same story. The Iran-Contra matter had occurred, they concluded, because of a failure to manage staff by the White House, which led to ambitious underlings, such as Oliver North and John Poindexter, to commit great wrongs in furtherance of what they perceived was the president's policy, and there was never a leash to pull them back. Robert McFarlane, Reagan's former national security advisor who had gotten everybody into this mess in the first place, blamed himself. Just before his scheduled testimony before the Tower Commission, on February 9th, 1987, he tried to kill himself with a deliberate overdose of Valium. He survived. Another key player in the scandal wasn't so lucky. On December 15th, 1986, CIA Director William Casey suffered a seizure as a result of a brain tumor. 
He was hospitalized, he did not recover, and died on May 6, 1987. Whatever he knew or did not know about Iran-Contra died with him. Recognizing that his own failure of leadership had caused the disaster, just after the Tower Report came out, Reagan accepted the resignation of his chief of staff, Donald Reagan, a move that Nancy had been urging for a long time. Despite screaming, I deserve better treatment than this, Reagan eventually slinked out of the White House. Reagan replaced him with former Senate Majority Leader Howard Baker, who had been once one of the lead investigators on the Watergate affair a dozen years earlier. Baker had presidential aspirations himself, but realized that by taking the job of chief of staff, especially in a White House spinning out of control, he would most likely never have a shot at the top job. He took chief of staff on the express understanding from Reagan that there would be no secrets and that he could clean house as he, Baker, saw fit with no interference. Reagan agreed. Baker told his own staff that he had three objectives. First, to get to the bottom of Iran-Contra. Second, to get an arms control deal with the Soviets. And third, to elect a Republican, presumably George Bush, president in 1988. One of the first things that happened on Baker's watch was a televised address from the Oval Office by the president. On March 4, 1987, after months of silence, Reagan came clean on Iran-Contra. He said, quote, A few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. As the Tower Board reported, what began as a strategic opening to Iran deteriorated in its implementation into trading arms for hostages. This runs counter to my own beliefs, to administration policy, and to the original strategy we had in mind. The Tower Commission was finished, but the investigations were just getting started. On December 19, 1986, Lawrence Walsh had been appointed by Edwin Meese, independent counsel, to investigate Iran-Contra and Congress's hearings were just ramping up. Baker, in the meantime, conducted his own internal investigation in the White House. To his credit, Ronald Reagan cooperated fully. The public perception and the political perception in the halls of Congress was that Baker was cleaning house and that Reagan was making a sincere effort to learn from his mistakes and conduct business differently going forward. This was in marked contrast to presidential responses to other scandals Watergate and the Lewinsky scandal later, specifically. Walsh, the independent counsel, was focusing on the two most likely culprits in the mess, Oliver North and John Poindexter. As early as May 1987, he interviewed President Reagan specifically about that December 6, 1985 meeting where the Iran initiative was discussed. When asked about various things, Reagan kept repeating, I can't remember. He was probably not stonewalling. He legitimately couldn't remember, especially when it came to details. On May 5, 1987, the day before William Casey died of brain cancer, Congress's televised hearings on the Iran-Contra matter got underway. They dragged on through the summer of 1987. I remember seeing them on TV constantly. In July, Oliver North, the mute Marine, finally spilled what he knew or what, what he wanted others to think that he knew. Having been given partial immunity from prosecution, he testified that he believed Reagan knew everything about the diversion and was privy to all the operational details. He admitted he destroyed documents at the suggestion of William Casey, who, being dead, was in no position to refute it. North didn't seem to be bothered by anything that he'd done and, in fact, was very proud of it. The Contra's secret war was worth it, he thought. On July 15th, it was Poindexter's turn. He claimed he had deliberately withheld knowledge of the diversion from President Reagan to give him plausible deniability. Certain points of North's and Poindexter's testimonies were refuted by copies of the Prof's notes and messages, the emails, copies of which had been found on the National Security Agency's computer server by White House Communications Agency investigators. Thus, Iran-Contra was the very first political scandal that involved scandalous emails. Schultz was up before the committees on July 23rd. He testified about his vocal opposition to the whole arms initiative in the first place, and notably in this case, 
all the notes and memos that anybody could produce backed him up. Schultz had been almost forced out of the White House in November. Reagan in particular hated him, but he managed to hang on, and he told Congress that he was sure Reagan had been fed a bunch of crap by his out-of-control advisors and that he knew nothing about the diversion. Schultz remained Secretary of State until the end of Reagan's term in January 1989. Richard Secord, who ran the logistics of the Contra resupply operation, perjured himself before the committees. He told Congress he did not profit personally from the operations. In fact, he did, to the tune of $2 million. Secord later pleaded guilty to a count of lying to Congress. For all the sound and fury of the hearings, the congressional investigations, which which released their reports in November 1987, didn't add much to the public understanding of what had happened. The congressional investigation was riven with partisanship and ended up filing two reports, a majority and a minority report. The majority basically agreed with the Tower Commission. The inmates, particularly North and Poindexter, essentially had taken over the asylum, and the warden, Ronald Reagan, was asleep at the wheel. The minority report, the one from Republicans, predictably blamed the whole thing on Democrats, saying that Congress had been too strict and technical with its wording on the kind of aid it banned to the Contras. That argument didn't gain much traction, except in conservative echo chambers. The Iran-Contra affair ultimately did nothing to fix the hostage crisis that the whole arms initiative had been created to try to solve. In fact, it seems to have made things worse. In January 1987, four new American hostages were taken in Beirut possibly as a result of the exposure of the deals. Another hostage was taken later in the year, and still more were abducted in 1988. What few hostages Reagan's deals had managed to free were quickly made up for by new abductions. In a scandal so complicated, so arcane, With its hinge, the diversion of Iran arms money to the Contras, buried so deep in the level of operational detail, it's tempting to dismiss the whole thing as irrelevant, at least in comparison to the harsh realities of more modern scandals. I keep bringing up the metaphor of Iran-Contra as a Rorschach test. You see in it what you want to see, and what you want to see is colored heavily by your partisan political viewpoint. Was Watergate worse? Was Clinton Lewinsky more scandalous? Were the issues in Donald Trump's two impeachments deeper and more fundamental than whatever was at stake in Iran-Contra? It's tempting to say yes and to dismiss this old 1980s scandal as quaint and irrelevant. Times have changed in 35 years. But I don't think we can dismiss it. It's worth a few words to try to understand why. It is important, and it matters. The biggest issue at stake in Iran-Contra was constitutional legitimacy. Several of the participants in the affair, especially Secretary of State George Shultz, made this argument at the time. Yes, the United States Constitution gives the president basic powers of conducting foreign policy. But the Constitution is explicit, and it goes out of its way to specify that the power of appropriations, of funding, lies with Congress, specifically the House of Representatives. When the Constitution was created in Philadelphia in 1787, its framers were careful to separate the powers among the various branches of government and departments within those branches. Congress was given the power to tax and to raise money directly, a power it had lacked under the Articles of Confederation. But the check on that power was that taxation and appropriation powers resided in the House, the legislative chamber that was thought closest and most accountable to the people. When Congress passed the Boland Amendment in 1982 prohibiting military aid to the Contras, the powers of the executive branch were checked. However much Ronald Reagan or Oliver North disagreed with that decision, they were bound by it. Congress did not want American taxpayer money going to fund a war, a secret war, in Central America. The Boland Amendment was attached to the Defense Appropriations Act, which Reagan signed on December 21, 1982. He accepted it. It was law. 
What North and Poindexter did was to make an end run around the Boland Amendment. They took government property, paid for by the taxpayers, and sold it to a foreign power, Iran. The money the government took from that sale, it gave illegally to a foreign army. This was not a covert operation in the traditional sense. Congress does fund covert operations by the CIA and others. The CIA submits a proposed budget and often doesn't tell Congress what it's spending taxpayer dollars on. That may seem sketchy, but it is legal, and it is constitutional. Iran-Contra, though, wasn't that. This was not part of a black budget, appropriated however blindly and spent however craftily by CIA bureaucrats. This was a sale of U.S. government property to fund an illegal war. Oliver North said he believed the money he diverted to the Contras belonged to Iran. At one point, George Bush made a similar argument. But that argument is wrong. Once Iran gave money to the United States, whether in exchange for weapons or as a donation or a bribe, that became federal money subject to appropriation by Congress. Conversely, the executive branch in the form of the NSC couldn't just take what it wanted from public coffers and give it to a foreign power. Even if the Boland Amendment wasn't in the picture, that would still be true. The way that North evidently found to be able to live with himself, telling himself that the cause of the Contras was so important that it was justifiable to disregard the laws against it, doesn't ring true. For one thing, the Contras were themselves terrorists associated with numerous atrocities and human rights violations. They were never able to shake the public perception that they were funded by drug trafficking. But even aside from that issue, to claim that supporting the Contras was so vital that it justified overriding the basic fabric of the Constitution was simply an appeal to authority, Ronald Reagan's authority. If a leader can do no wrong, if his judgment is or should be law simply because it's his, that gets us dangerously close to the crime that the insurrectionists at the Capitol on January 6, 2021 were trying to commit. That is, the subjugation of the constitutional order and the rule of law to the will and indeed the whim of a single man. In a democratic society, there must be accountability. There must be checks and balances. Yes, there are unjust laws and unwise laws, but democracies tamper with constitutional checks and balances at their hazard. George Shultz understood this, so, I think, did Ronald Reagan. If Oliver North did nothing wrong, why did he destroy documents? Why did he take the Fifth Amendment for so long? Why did he play the role of the mute Marine? If the whole thing was right and proper, why did Poindexter work so hard to keep Ronald Reagan in the dark? Simple politics? Reagan, he was a master politician. He could handle politics. He needed no help from North or Poindexter or Fawn Hall stuffing documents into her blouse. Like him or hate him, Ronald Reagan was ill-served by his servants. Whatever anybody's political stripe, in 1987, almost everyone could agree on that. Iran-Contra had a very long tail. This video could be half as long again as it already is if I went into great detail, so we're going to tie up the loose ends as concisely as possible. Oliver North was indicted in 16 felony counts of various crimes related to Iran-Contra. In May 1989, he was convicted of three of those counts, including lying to Congress and destroying evidence. The problem, at least for the government, was that he had received partial immunity from prosecution in exchange for his testimony to Congress in 1987, and his immunized testimony may have tainted the trial. His conviction was vacated in 1990. The next year, the remaining charges were dropped. John Poindexter was also indicted and convicted of similar crimes. And, very similar to North's case, his conviction was also questioned as a result of the role of congressional testimony for which he had been immunized, at least partially, in 1987. Poindexter's convictions were reversed on appeal in 1991. Robert McFarlane pleaded guilty in 1988 to misdemeanor charges for lying to Congress. 
he got two years of probation and a fine. Richard Secord pleaded guilty 1989 lying to Congress, sentenced two years probation. Numerous others involved in the scandal were indicted, some convicted, some pled guilty. People like Elliot Abrams, Dwayne Claridge, Thomas Kleins, etc. I have elected not to focus on them just to try to keep this story from becoming so unwieldy with characters. George Bush, the vice president, was never able to shake the specter of Iran-Contra. It hung like a dark shadow over his own run for president in 1988, as investigations were fading from headlines, but criminal indictments for the principals were just ramping up. Bush had been briefed several times on the Iran Arms Initiative, most notably in July 1986 by Amiran Nir, an Israeli official involved on Israel's side of the deal. All of the documentary evidence indicates that Bush generally approved of the arms deals with Iran, and he may have had a greater understanding of their scope and purpose than President Reagan did. But again, as with Reagan, evidence is lacking when it comes to knowledge of the diversion of funds to the Contras. Iran-Contra did not catch fire as a campaign issue, perhaps in part because his Democratic opponent in 1988, Michael Dukakis, was extraordinarily weak and generally inept at exploiting any political opportunity against Bush. The sitting vice president won a lopsided victory against Dukakis in November 1988, but it was something of a hollow victory. Bush never clearly articulated his vision for the country and was generally regarded as the executor of what was essentially Reagan's third term. That wasn't how it turned out in the end, but many people did think that was going to be it at the time Bush took office in January 1989. Bush inherited the Lebanon hostage crisis from Ronald Reagan. It did not occupy the same amount of his attention as it had Reagan's. The Lebanese Civil War was ramping down. There was an agreement called the Taif Agreement, signed in early 1989. Although violence continued in Lebanon throughout the next two years, it gradually tapered off. The Contras never managed to win their war against the Sandinista regime. In 1990, the Sandinistas were voted out of power in a more or less peaceful election when Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega was defeated by Violeta Chamorro. The Sandinistas returned to power, again by election, not conquest, in 2006. The domino effect that Ronald Reagan feared never came to pass. As of the time this video is being made in early 2023, Ortega is still president of Nicaragua. Ayatollah Khomeini died in June 1989. His funeral was such a circus that people literally ripped his body out of its coffin. The so-called moderates in Iran that McFarlane thought he'd been dealing with never materialized. In August 1990, Saddam Hussein, the dictator of Iraq, invaded Kuwait, intending mainly to loot it and to cancel the massive debts that Hussein had run up with Kuwait during the Iran-Iraq war. The Iraqi invasion incidentally solved the issue of the al-Dawa prisoners, who, as you recall, were among the main ransom demands for the Westerners held in Beirut. After the multinational coalition of military forces led by Bush ejected Hussein from Kuwait, the hostage crisis fizzled. The last American hostage, Terry Anderson, was released at the beginning of December 1991, having spent six years in custody. Two Germans, the last Western hostages of all, were set free in June 1992. The Persian Gulf War did not end the Iran-Contra affair. Bush felt dogged, perhaps even persecuted, by the ongoing investigation of Lawrence Walsh, the independent counsel, who was appointed in December 1986 and whose investigation stretched on incredibly through the entirety of Bush's term in office. As the years wore on, Walsh became increasingly interested in Caspar Weinberger, Reagan's former Secretary of Defense. Although a minor player in Iran-Contra, Walsh investigated Weinberger for making false statements to Congress and impeding investigations. In June 1992, when Bush was running for re-election, Walsh indicted Weinberger on five counts. Pursuant to this investigation, Walsh arranged to interview former President Ronald Reagan one last time. He was not a target of Walsh's investigation, but was a p potential witness. On July 24, 1992, Walsh and his team interviewed former President Reagan at an office in Los Angeles. 
The interview was shocking. Reagan was very much aged, and his mental acuity had declined precipitously. He barely remembered who George Schultz was. He remembered nothing about TWA 847. He recalled meeting Gorbachev, but very little else. Far from being useful as a potential witness in a trial against Weinberger, Reagan's memory was significantly gone. It would still be two years before Reagan's public statement that he had Alzheimer's disease, but it was clear that its symptoms had manifested long before then, possibly even beginning in his second term in office. If Reagan ever knew anything substantive about Iran, the Iran-Contra diversion, he quickly forgot it. Reagan, of course, died of Alzheimer's disease in 2004. Walsh issued one final indictment against Weinberger only days before the 1992 election. Many Republicans believed this indictment coming into the news cycle so shortly before the vote ensured Bush's defeat. I really don't think it made a difference. Bush's re-election campaign in 1992 was limp and lifeless. He seemed tired and out of touch. As in 1988, he failed to convey any coherent picture of where he wanted to take America, and his main attack on challenger Bill Clinton was that Clinton dodged the Vietnam draft and was apparently not a fervent enough believer in American exceptionalism. All the polls showed Bush significantly behind going into Election Day, and the third-party candidacy of Ross Perot was doing him no favors. Nevertheless, Bush was bitter about his defeat, and especially the role he thought Walsh might have played in it, partly to end the nightmare of Iran-Contra, and perhaps partially out of spite, Bush issued pardons to Caspar Weinberger and a few other Iran-Contra figures on Christmas Eve 1992, after the election, but before Clinton took office. Walsh wound up his investigation and his stint as investigative counsel ended on August 4th, 1993, nearly seven years after he'd been appointed. Oliver North tried to go into politics, emphasis on the tried. In 1994, he ran for a Senate seat in Virginia, against Charles Robb, who incidentally was Lyndon Johnson's son-in-law. Robb trounced him. North wound up in 2018 as president of the National Rifle Association, but he quit that job after a feud with NRA chairman Wayne LaPierre. He now writes books. After Poindexter's criminal convictions were reversed on appeal, he went into the defense contracting business, working for various high-tech firms and on defense projects. He's still alive and is today an election denier, pushing the baseless conspiracy theory that the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump. Robert McFarlane also became a consultant, especially on international nuclear issues. He died in 2022. Donald Reagan, Reagan's disgraced chief of staff, wrote a kiss-and-tell memoir of his time in the White House, which publicly exposed the scandal that the Reagans were heavily influenced by kooky astrologer Joan Quigley. Regan died in 2003, Quigley in 2014. Manukur Gorbanifar, the Iranian arms dealer, is still alive. He popped up in a couple of different capers loosely related to the war on terror in the 2000s, but it's not clear what he's up to these days. Eugene Hassenfuss, the CIA man shot down over Nicaragua, was sentenced to 30 years by a Nicaraguan court, but was pardoned as an act of mercy by Daniel Ortega, and he returned to the United States. Many decades later, he served time in Wisconsin for indecent exposure. The plane in which Hasenfuss was flying that day was incidentally turned into a pub in Costa Rica. Fawn Hall, Oliver North's former secretary, briefly dated actor Rob Lowe, and she also dated the son of one of the leaders of the Contras. In the 90s, she married Danny Sugerman, former manager of The Doors and author of the Jim Morrison biography, no one here gets out alive. He is now deceased. Fawn is still alive, living quietly in L.A. In 1985 and 86, the United States government sold military-grade weapons to the country of Iran, a sponsor of various terrorist groups, as sort of an indirect ransom for hostages held by some of those same groups that Iran sponsored. Money received from those weapons sales was secretly diverted to fund a covert army, the Contras, that was fighting against the socialist government of Nicaragua. All of these actions were either illegal or contrary to the stated policy of the United States, or both. That's the basic summary of the Iran-Contra scandal. 
But I hope you understand now, as complicated and impenetrable as this scandal is, the wall of crazy personified in real life, that it does matter in history. It matters not only to the legacy of Ronald Reagan, but to the political and constitutional history of the United States as a whole. I made this video because I fear that the Iran-Contra affair is in danger of being eclipsed or even forgotten in popular historical memory. In all the momentous events that have occurred since 1986, most of them bigger, flashier, and more memorable, something like Iran-Contra is in real danger of becoming just a dusty little detail on the bottom page of a history book that no one reads. It shouldn't be that. Now you know something about it too. If you liked this video or learned something from it, please do all the things you normally do for a video you like, click the thumbs up button, or subscribe, you know the drill. I have several other deep dive videos on my channel, such as the comprehensive early history of the Amway multi-level marketing tools cult, a video essay on the meaning of the Titanic disaster, and a two-parter on the facts behind the John F. Kennedy assassination. Check those out. Thanks very much for joining me on another journey into the past. Thank you.